How do you do? I'm Daniel Snyder. This is my hat, Fiona. This episode, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce to you a man who's not only a good friend of mine, but also an authority on Japanese culture, on manga and anime, and just an all-around swell guy. He's the author of Manga Manga and Dreamland Japan, which are considered two of the quintessential works on the genre. Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Schott, welcome to the show. It's glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, the pleasure's mine. Um, let's begin with uh, a history, uh, sort of a history of uh, manga. What are the historical origins of manga in Japanese culture? Uh, I think you can go back uh, you know, a long, long way in Japanese uh, history to the 12th century even, and right. you can see the origins of manga in, and even some, some of the origins of anime in s scrolls, illustrated scrolls. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are other genres of art that appeared in Japan, such as woodblock prints, and there were even books that were issued, humor, illustrated humor books that were issued in the uh, late 18th and 19th century that actually very similar to manga today, but the basic grammar, in other words, the sequential panels and then the use of word balloons, that was imported from the United States at the turn of this century. So basically what we have is a, a fusion of traditional love of art that was narrative and entertained with the grammar that was imported from the United States because what we think of as comic books and comic strips at least was developed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when then would sort of the modern manga scene have taken off? I think that the manga really became distinct as uh, something different from what was emerging in the United States. Uh, fairly early in Japan, uh, the, the first indication that something different was appearing was around the 1930s when he found books, hardback books that were appearing in Japan that were com what we would call comic books, except they were over 100 pages long and they were hardback books. And they were compilations of stories that had been serialized in monthly magazines, whereas in the United States the first comic books were actually compilations of comic strips that had first appeared in newspapers, so that was a major difference. Um, in, in terms of the storytelling, though, the really big difference began uh, after the war when you had the appearance of artists like uh, Osamu Tezuka, oh, yes. who more or less decompressed storylines, and uh, they began using more and more pages and more and more space to depict an action. So whereas in a U.S. comic you might have had one panel to show uh, Superman doing something in the Japanese version or the Japanese style that would take many pages. So it made things very visual and that's really the hallmark of modern modern manga. As well as the uh, extended storylines yeah. that this would uh, permit. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Osamu Tezuka. Do you consider do you think that there were uh, sort of any other um, driving uh, forces that shaped uh, manga, such as he did? Uh, very much so. I think he was one of the main driving forces behind the long story, narrative story, and what they call in Japan the story manga, or story manga. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was really the pioneer who got that going. But there were other factors that, that made made it so successful. One of those, I think, was the fact that after World War II, young people were just starved for inexpensive entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and television hadn't really taken off yet. So there was this vacuum. There was this huge demand and need for something that was entertaining, was inexpensive and accessible. Mm -hmm. And comics just fit that perfectly. Uh, and also in Japan, they managed to get through the, the early 50s without the same sort of censorship program that we had here in the United States. So a lot of different factors and a lot of cultural factors too that, that made manga, I think, really explo explode right after the war. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's uh, skip a little bit uh, further forward in time. Um, the manga scene in Japan today, who, who do you see as sort of the, um, uh, the major players, and just for the benefit of the audience maybe, who may not be that well acquainted with uh, manga, what, what are their... Uh, what are their hallmark uh, ships? Oh, well, there's so many manga artists in Japan today. As you, as you probably know, manga are now 40% of all 
published books and magazines in Japan, so it's this giant, yeah. <laughs> absolutely humongous yeah, phenomenon. I guess I may have uh, bit off a little more than I can chew well, with that question. Yeah, it's 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 hard to say who the uh, the main players are because it depends on uh, what your favorite genre is. Uh, there's comics for their manga for men and their manga for women and their manga for you know college students and teenagers and it's all segmented. I think we can say though that the there, there is a sort of changing of the guard going on right now in okay. Japan um, because for many, many years Tezuka tended to dominate the whole uh, scene because he was such a prolific and extraordinary person. And then after he died in 1989, many of the people who had been his protégés uh, were really right on the front lines and sort of dominating the industry. And many of those people, unfortunately, because of hard work and overwork, uh, have have uh, been passing away recently, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is kind of a changing of the guard in terms of the people who are at the peak of the pyramid. Uh, people like uh, Shotaro Ishinomori just passed away not too long ago, and in the last year also um, uh, the creator of Doraemon, which is enormously popular, uh, Fujimoto, also passed away. So there are more and more younger people who are coming up. There's a lot of artists that I think we will start hearing more and more about. Uh, one, one of my personal favorites is uh, Taiyo Matsumoto, um, who's being serialized right now, actually, in uh, Pulp. Oh, yes. Uh, but he has some works that I think are just extraordinary. So there's people like this who are really in the genius and, and just extraordinary category that we'll be hearing a lot more. Um sort of uniting this uh, diversity in the manga scene, do you see any themes that uh, tend to unite really popular manga? Um, the ones that sort of carry on through time or that are recurrent in uh, really popular authors' works? Well, there's sort of cycles in Japan, so in one decade you might have uh, sort of lighthearted school romances be popular in boys' comics and in girls' comics, and then you might have a resurrection of comics that deal with uh, sort of more manly themes of you know courage and, <laughs> and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and it's, it's kind of a cyclical yeah. effect at work. And uh, I, I, but I don't think you can I don't think you can say at this point because the it's such a huge phenomenon. I don't think you can say that there's any single theme that runs across all of the different genres anymore. It's just too big. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you a question uh, that surfaced in um, an earlier episode. Uh, we had a gentleman on who was former uh, English as a second, la second language teacher in Japan. And um, he, had, um, he had remarked that he, um, his perception was that in Japan there was uh, a juvenile stigma attached to a lot of anime. Um, clearly there, uh, there's a lot more manga in Japan right. than there is anime. Um, do you see the stigma? And if so, I know that for a fact that um, a lot of anime is uh, taken um, from manga series. Right. Uh, how do the how do the two relate to one another? If there is this uh, the stigma attached. Uh, well, first of all, I think that everything is relative, so mm -hmm. it, it it depends wh where you where your point of reference is. If you're comparing it to of the United States, there probably isn't as much stigma uh, around anime as there might be in the United States, where I think most the general population probably still regards cartoons as something for for children. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true that in Japan, anime are still regarded probably by the general public as something for younger people more than manga. Uh, but that used to be true of manga too. Manga, of course, were regarded as entertainment for very young children in the post-war period, and it took a long time. And the readers of manga, instead of giving up their manga as they aged, they held on to them, so that now you have manga being read by people who are in their 50s. And the, the only people who are not really totally immersed in the manga phenomenon now in Japan are, are really the senior citizens and then the, the people, the, the young children who are so young that they, they can't even read yet. Um, so we'll probably see anime being becoming having a, a, a wider audience 
as the, as the, the fans of anime age. And I think that's already happening. That's one reason we're seeing you know, these very interesting works that are coming out of Japan uh, over the years with very sophisticated themes. Uh, because anime, of course, got a later start than manga, just because the TV technology in mm -hmm. particular. TV having diffused a lot later. Well, um, see that we're about out of time, so I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for oh, stopping by today. Thank and, you. Um, My pleasure. Be sure to come by some other okay. time. All right. All right.